anyway, uh, my name's Chad, and uh, there's a bit of a change here for why I'm here today. I mean, I'm on staff here. I'm a campus ministry apprentice, and um, if you're checking us out on MoChurch.tv, welcome. We're glad you're here with us today. And Bibles are on the ends of the rows, by the way, so if you want to use your Bible, pass it to the middle. We're going to be jumping around a few spots today, but I'm here. I'm glad to be here. Are you glad to be here today? This is a good place to be, right? High school students, you just came off a week of camp. How was that? Was that good? By Yeah, let's... So, um, Dan's had pneumonia for the past week, so it's been crazy, and I told him, like, Curtis had it earlier in the year, and I said, you've doubled the amount of people I've ever known with pneumonia, you know, like, and you're also the youngest people probably on earth to ever have it, like, I've never known anybody less than 80 to have it, so, um, like, this very, but he's been bad, he's in bad shape, but he's doing really, he's doing a lot better, but... So I stepped in Friday. I found out we're, I'm going to be doing this. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be with you guys. And, uh, but I, I do have to say, we've been here since December. We moved to Cleveland in December. And if you have friends or relatives, please hear me out. Tell them, don't move to Cleveland in winter. Like, don't, like, it, you can come visit, but don't move. And, you know, like, there's, I found out, like, you have to add snow boots to your apparel. Like, that's not a thing. Where I came from, that's not a thing. So, yeah, so... But we love it. We're having a great time. My wife, Hannah, and our two boys, Cash and Joss, we're, we, just, we just love Cleveland, and we're so glad to be at Momentum Church, and I'm just so glad to be able to share with you guys today. So, again, past Bibles, we're going to be looking around there today, but I want to ask you this question, because, uh, you know, there's a lot, change is a big thing in our lives, right? There's a lot of change, but what's the biggest change you've ever had to go through? What's the biggest change that affected you in your life? The, the, the thing that, you know, when you go there in your mind, it's vivid. It's like visceral. You can see it. You can sense it. You can smell it. You can remember the color of the wallpaper. Like, you can, it's a big deal change. Maybe it was good. Maybe it was bad. For me, it wasn't moving here, though. That was a big change. For me, it happened in 1992. Yes, the 1900s. It happened in the 1900s. So, um, for me, there was a lot of confusion going on in my life. I just graduated high school in 1991. I went off to a small Christian college in Joplin, Missouri called Ozark Christian College. And uh, yeah, we knew about Kentucky Christian, but you know, they weren't real that good. So um, anyway, just kidding. Um, but I, I really didn't want to be there. You know, I went, to, I went to that school for one year. I said I'd go for one year. It was a Christian school. The Christian school I went to, their intent is to put pastors and, and missionaries into the world. I went to follow some friends to go to school. So high school students, listen up. It's a very expensive way to keep friends is to go, to, you know, pick in school that way. So I went, and I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to do, I didn't want to be in ministry. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't go to church at all my freshman year of college at a Christian school. They had chapel services. I slept through them all. Like, we had a joke. We went to Bedside Baptist today for church. Like, we just, we slept through everything. I slept through everything my freshman year. And at the end, I was like, I'm not going back. I wanted to be a lawyer. And so, <laughs> why are you laughing? Like... <laughs> my first time up here, I'm going to get laughed at, but that's what I wanted to be, like, because I was really good at arguing with my mom, and so I was like, I can do this, and so I, I was like, it, there's got to be a career in this for me somehow, I don't win all the time, but I can sure figure that out, and so I was like, I'm going to go, and the, the, the university in the state I, I lived in was Iowa, I was going to University of Iowa, so I was going to switch schools and go there, and guys, let me tell you, the plans I have for myself are not the plans you want to think about your kid having for them, right? I, had, I wanted to party. I wanted to drink. I wanted to sleep around with girls. These are the things I wanted to do. And you're like, well, you went to a Christian school. If you know a little bit more about me, I got baptized when I was eight. I spent most of my memory of life in church, but I was not connected to Jesus. Just wasn't. It wasn't that important to me. And so I was just so far from my mind, but yet the summer of 1992 was the end of July. It was hot. You know, where I grew up, there's a lot of cornfields around. And if you're around a cornfield, cornfields make it feel hotter because of the humidity of the fields. And it was hot. This camp was hot. And I just remember being hot. We're in this 
in this uh, cafeteria, which is basically like a, you know, a big steel sweat box. I mean, anybody who goes in there just gets hotter because it's just intense heat. That's where we had all our meals. And, you know, it was white walls and a ceiling similar to this, you know, steel ceiling. And it was like concrete floor and those wooden cafeteria tables you might remember. And, the, and you know, and we were doing dishes this Thursday night because that's what you did at the, your family group went and did dishes. You had a night of the week you did dishes. And so Thursday night was my night with my family group. I was a college student volunteering at a Christian week at camp. How hypocritical is that? Because I didn't want to be a Christian. So if you like, I'm not into Christianity because all Christians are hypocrites. I'm the guy you blame. Like, but something happened that night. I, had a, I was doing dishes. You know, it had one of those dishwashers that you slide the thing through, you slam the doors down the sides, right? It's like a car wash for dishes. And so we are, I can remember all of it. And there was this guy from the college I went to named Tim Beasley. And Tim had no idea what I actually wanted to do. He knew I wasn't going to come back. And Tim was there from Ozark. And he said to me, hey, Chad, I don't, I don't think you ought to go back to Ozark. And you know, I'm like, here we go again, another Christian who's going to tell me what to do with my life. You know, that's so awesome when they do that. And so I'm mean, going to listen to him. But he said, I don't think you should do whatever it is you want to go do. I think you should be a youth minister because I've seen the way you've interacted with students around here. Like, that just seems like that's what you should do. And guys, it was in this moment, like it was such a weird kind of a benign thing to say to someone but in my mind I'm going no no that's not going to be there's no money in that there's no prestige in that you know no one you make your family weird when you're a minister because everybody's like oh Chad's here we can't cuss and swear now you know and so I just like I, I don't want that but my heart my heart was going yeah that's what I want right that's what that's what I'm listening to is those words, those words of truth getting into my heart and getting into my mind. And Jesus was working on my heart, but he hadn't made it to my head yet. So my head was still going this way, my heart was going this way, and Thursday night I decided I'm going to go that way with my heart. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that conversation, that change that happened in my life, I wouldn't be here. That someone got involved and someone said something in my life. He didn't know what he's doing, but he just said something. And change affects us all. It changed everything for me. Everything was now different. I went back to Ozark. Now realize, I wasn't fully healed, right? So you don't, we're going to see today, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to behave perfectly to get back in. You just have to have a little bit of belief and faith that God's going to do the rest of the work. So there's hope for anybody just, just know that there's hope for everybody, but it changed my life. And many of you are going through changes. You know, we moved here. That was a big change for us. My son switched schools. That was a big change for him. You know, you're going through stuff like you switched jobs. You, you recently found out you're going to have a baby or you just had a baby. And, you know, maybe there's been a recent death. Maybe there's someone about to die. Maybe there's been a divorce or divorce is, is coming your way. Uh, maybe you're about to get married or you know you just got engaged and there's all these changes happening like chad i understand change i just switched from android to iphone like that's a big change you know you know what change is like and so maybe you're a student you're switching schools you know you're going from middle school to high school and there's changes with that and maybe you're a teacher and you're getting a new class and there's changes with that your tastes have changed you're older now your prescriptions have changed you know <laughs> Your studies have changed. We hear phrases like change your clothes or change that kid's diaper. Don't ever change or the dreaded, hmm, something about you's changed. Like, change is all around us. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus, guys, I had to practice saying that a lot, Heraclitus. He said this, the only constant in life is change. Don't know what that comma is there for, but anyway, <laughs> the only constant in life is change. It's the only thing that keeps happening right? Change is all around us. It's constantly happening. But here's how I want to connect this to Jesus in Scripture. Is look at this right here. When Jesus gets involved, change starts with you allowing Jesus to change. And we're going to highlight allowing. Like, you have to give him permission. It's up to you whether or not Jesus changes you. It's not up to Jesus. It's up to you. He's available at all times, 24-7. He's like 7-Eleven, you know. But he's ready to change you. If you give him the permission, but then look what happens. As he changes you, that change in you affects others. 
You know, one of the big themes around here at Momentum Church is making disciples who make disciples. And this is what it is. I became a disciple. Change happened in my life. Now, what I need to do is do the work of making other disciples. Change affected me. We're going to shift our attention to focus on others. That's what happens when Jesus gets involved. And so what I want to do is illustrate this to you in some stories. Okay, three stories from Scripture, and then a couple more stories towards the end. So we're just going to go into story time here. I forgot my Mr. Rogers card again, but we'll go for it. You know, so I want to look at the life of Peter, all right? And we look, we find Peter in John chapter 1. So if you've got a Bible, look at a Bible, we're looking at John chapter 1. Turn to the middle and find Matthew and go two books down the road to the, cha- or three books down the road to the book of John. In John chapter 1, it says that Jesus is out. He's out now. His ministry is about to begin, and he's going to start picking his disciples, okay? The guys who are going to be his followers, all right? And he comes upon these two brothers who are fishermen. He finds them fishing, and so he goes to these two fishermen. He comes up to Andrew first. Andrew and Simon are these two brothers. He comes to Andrew first and says, hey, come follow me. All right, which is really weird, right? Like some rando guy just pops into your, hey, come follow me. Okay, like I don't, I don't know what was in Andrew's head, but something was compelling about what Jesus had to say to him, and Andrew goes and follows him. Well, he goes and finds his brother Simon, who's fishing, and the first thing he tells Simon is, I'm going to change your name. So, so Simon hasn't even been introduced to Jesus yet, right? He doesn't even know Jesus' name. And Jesus is like, Hey, I'm changing your name to Peter. Look in John 1, 42. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently, this is so interesting. When you look, when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't just like look and turn and walk away. Like he's looking at you. He's looking into your life. He looks intently at Simon and says, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will now be called Cephas, which means Peter, which translated means rock. The reason he changed his name to rock was Peter's going to say something later on in Scripture. We find him confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, right? And Jesus says, on that statement, on the statement, your confession you made about me, that's what I'm going to build the church on, is that I am the rock. I am the Son of God. So you think, man, he picked someone pretty reliable to trust this with. I don't know if you're at Easter, but Dan talked about Peter's life being kind of a crazy life. And it is like he's got the totally ironic title now of being like the rock of the church. But people who would have known him, went to school with him, would have been like, Simon? Um, you can't be talking about the Simon I know. Like he's anything but reliable. I mean, he's impulsive. He's inconsistent. He's unpredictable. You know, I mean, he... he I just don't trust the guy, but Jesus does for some reason, and he winds up following Jesus, and they do this tour around the country, and Jesus, you see that Jesus is affecting his life so much, but there's still this, Peter's still doing the stuff that Peter does, so it's just kind of peppered with mistakes and outbursts and betrayal, and even one instance where he cuts a guy's ear off. Like, Peter's just, who knows what Peter's going to do, but Jesus trusts him. We fast forward to Acts chapter 2. This is after Jesus has died. This is after Jesus has gone to heaven. This is after Jesus said, my Holy Spirit is now going to come. It's going to come live inside of you. After that's all happened, Peter stands up before a crowd and 3,000 people come to Jesus and get baptized because of what Peter says. Like that's huge. And, and, and And studies would show us about ancient times, those numbers when we see people counted in Scripture is just an indication of how many men were there. 3,000, we think, men, okay? But if you add into that women and children, because oftentimes when a man became a follower, the whole household was affected by that, that number could double, triple, even quadruple. So this is a very large crowd that come to know who Jesus is for the first time. And so what this story indicates is do not count yourself out, right? You think, man, I make mistakes, I do stupid stuff, I say stupid things. Like, do not count yourself out. Like, Jesus didn't count Peter out. He used Peter, changed Peter, and then Peter went on to change other things. And other people were affected by the change that happened in Peter. Let's look at another story. Let's look at the life of Paul. Acts chapter 9. 
Paul is also called Saul in Scripture, but this wasn't because Jesus changed his name. It was just two names he had. So his job was to go out, find Christians, and kill them, persecute them. Christians were living on the run in this time because the government was threatened by Christianity. They heard about a king and like, we can't have another kings because Caesar is king. And so we got to stop this Christianity thing. We got to kill it. So they started killing Christians. And Paul was a leader of the guys who would kill Christians. Okay. And so we see in Acts chapter seven, just a couple chapters before that Paul is actually presiding over the killing of a Christian man named Stephen. And Stephen, they stoned Stephen because of his faith. And it wasn't the kind of stoning where it was like, they, he smoked marijuana to death. It's the kind of death. Now, now with me, they dig a hole in the ground as tall as the person is, bury them up to the shoulders and throw rocks at their head. Like, this is a, this is a ceremonial killing of a Christian. And Paul was there going, yes. He was there cheering it on. But if you fast forward... Paul has this encounter with Jesus in chapter 9. He's traveling to a town called Damascus. We don't know why. But he's, he, he has an encounter with Jesus. Jesus speaks. And what we see is Paul is blinded, physically blinded by what he hears. And in Acts 9, 7 through 9, it says, Even the men stood speechless as you would when your friends blinded. They heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. That's pretty weird. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus, where they were going. He remained there blind for three days, and he did not... Now, I, I'm going to come back to this. So what did he not do? Eat or drink. Eat or drink. It's so weird that that's in there. But I want to highlight it in just a second. So he goes to Damascus. God has already moved downstream from this event, right? He's already moving ahead. And he's preparing things for Paul. So he goes to this guy named Ananias in Damascus. And he says to Ananias, hey, I'm sending Saul to your house. He's going to come and you're going to take care of him. And it's like, oh, uh, no. I know who that guy is. He killed some of my buddies. Like, like he knows who Saul is, as you would, you know, you know, Charles Manson's coming to visit your house today. Uh-oh. <laughs> Okay, I need to change the locks. Like, Ananias is probably a little freaked out. But when you read Scripture, he was, now he was convinced by what God had said, that he welcomed him in, he took care of him, and he recovers. Paul recovers. His sight is restored. And what do you think that he does next? Like, he hasn't eaten or drank for three days. I'm like going to Subway or, or some, something better than Subway, that's for sure, to eat and drink because I haven't done it in three days. But look what he does in Acts 9.20 immediately. He hasn't eaten or drank anything that we know of. Maybe it wasn't recorded. I'm assuming he didn't, but immediately he's preaching about Jesus. Immediately he's telling the story in the synagogues, which are the, church, the Jewish churches in that, in that time, saying he is indeed the Son of God. So he's saying what Peter said. Jesus, you're the Son of God. Now Paul's saying it. So even the things that Peter said have affected Paul's life. He's changing other people's lives. He's moving. God changed him, and now he's doing the work of changing others. So he's on the run now. Like, he's killer of Christians. Now those people who are killing Christians are after him because he's now, you know, on the number one most wanted list for who we got to get. So he's on the run. So what do you think he would do? Go into hiding, find a cave, you know, find a spot to, you know, just kind of chill? No, in Acts 9.31, it says this, the church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Why do you think it had peace? Don't you think it would have been under more persecution? I think because Paul's now a Christian, he's on the home team. Oh, that guy who was killing all these Christians, we don't have to worry about him so much now because he's one of us. So there's peace in the church. It became stronger. The believers lived in fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. So there's growth now. There's growth when God gets involved. Numeric growth, even. People's lives are changed and touched by the person who is changed and touched by the Lord. So again, don't count yourself out. Paul, a killer of Christians, changed, now becoming a Christian himself. And most of the New Testament... Like, three-fourths of it is written by Paul. He's a missionary. He starts churches all over that part of the world. 
I mean, it's explosive, the stuff he did. So do not count yourself out. Third story. While in Samaria, this is, a, this is an area, okay, Samaria is like Michigan, okay? You don't want to go there unless you have to go. Like, if you're from Michigan, I'm sorry. If you're viewing, watching this from, in Michigan online, hey, but the Jews thought of Samaria, you don't go there. There's Samaritans there. They were very racist towards the Samaritans. They had big cultural issue differences. We're the chosen people and the Samaritans are not. So if you ever read inscription here, the word Gentile, that would be, that would include Samaritans because they're not the chosen people. We don't like them. We don't want to mess with them. We don't marry with them. You know, they don't, they don't have anything to do with them. So for Jesus to go to Samaria out of his way was like, what are you doing? What are you up to? But he comes to this woman, a Samaritan woman. She's come to a nearby well to get water. And while she's there, they have this discussion, Jesus and the woman, about water. They have the discussion about the well. Where'd the well come from? Whose well is this? The history of the well. Where they talk about how thirst gets satisfied. And Jesus uses the well and the water as an illustration to tell her about a water and a well that will never run dry and you will always be satisfied. And she's like, yep, that's what I want. Where's this water? And he says, I am that water. I am that water. I am the son of God whoa, I'm meeting with the Son of God at a well. Like, this is crazy. And I'm a Samaritan. He's a Jew. This doesn't happen. Like, what's going on? And so Jesus then after that says, hey, I want you to go get your husband. And she says, "Uh funny story. I don't have a husband. He goes, you're right. You have five. And okay, this guy's already talking to me about, how does he know my stuff? Does he follow me on Facebook and know all this stuff about me? Like, so she freaks a little bit and tells him, you got to be some sort of prophet. And Jesus you know, I'm the son of God. And then look what happens in John 28 through 30. The woman left her water beside the well, ran back into the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. I mean, everything she ever did, uh, we don't see that. We just see this five husbands thing. But could he be the Messiah? Messiah just simply means the anointed one or the chosen one of God to save us. So the people came streaming, the Bible uses the word streaming from the village to see him. And she doesn't even know everything yet, right? So if you don't, I, I just don't know enough about Jesus to make a decision. Here's a story of someone who didn't know everything, just knew a little bit, but yet went and told other people about him. You don't have to know everything to tell people about Jesus. You just have to know what he said to you and speak that story to people. What's crazy about this also is that he didn't even give her good news. He gave her bad news. He told her about sin that was going on in her life. And she still went and told other people about like, if Jesus comes in your life and points out your sin, is the first response that you're going to, I'm going to go tell people about all this sin that Jesus pointed out. (laughs) No, she goes into town, tells her friends and neighbors, come see this guy. So if you're not sure about Jesus, that's great. Invite someone else who isn't sure about Jesus and come investigate him here. Because this is a place you could do that in, by the way, and ask questions. Just like she didn't have all the answers, but she went and told others. Because this woman went and told others, it says in John 4, 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman said. So they believed in Jesus, not the woman. They believed in Jesus because she said, he told me everything I ever did. So that's all she said. Here's a guy who told me everything he did. Well, I believe in Jesus now. You see how simple this message can be? It doesn't have to be like you have a professor and he's telling you like it's just a simple thing. It's a simple message. So and again, do not count yourself out. Chad, I've been through four divorces. Chad, I've done this, I've done that. I mean, Jesus will use anybody, anybody to get his message out. But he needs you to accept the change first, so that you can then move on to focus on others. All these people have an encounter with Jesus. It changes them, and that effect then changes others. So it got me thinking, you know, what about you? What about me? You know, what what about you and me? Has the change that Jesus has done, if, if he's done a change in your life, is it so amazing, so crazy? You know, that song is saying, the reckless love of God he chases me over mountains like he's, he leaves things to find me. Like, is that, 
Is that compelling enough? Is the forgiveness of your sins and the promise of eternity, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, is that compelling enough for you to share that message with somebody else? Is it moving you enough? I want to tell you a story about a guy named Ryan. In the first service, I didn't have his permission. I got permission in the second service. I can use his name now. But Ryan is a guy that I used to know back in Indiana and where we moved here from at the church I worked at previously. And Ryan, his, his high school years were, were just, you know, he did whatever he wanted to do. He partied, he drank, he did all kinds of stuff. He was like a, like a state championship wrestler. And I mean, everybody knew who Ryan was. Even other high schools knew who Ryan was. And I mean, it, it was just, I worked out with guys who went to high school with Ryan. And they're like, yeah, we know about Ryan. We know what Ryan used to do. Hey, you know they became a Jesus? Jesus follower? Yeah, we know that too, because he won't shut up about it. Like, Ryan got so jacked up by Jesus, like a lit match. He was just on fire for the Lord. So much so that he's like, I'm going to start a Bible study at the job I work at. I saw people doing Bible study. I'm going to do that. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to open up the Bible and see what happens and do it at work. And like, he, for all, for all he knew, he's going to be the only guy doing it. Well, God grew that thing because Ryan his life was so like out there that people were attracted to that. Then Ryan does another crazy thing. He's started volunteering at church and he gets involved in the children's ministry and he's a small group leader for first grade boys. And he does another crazy thing. He takes those first grade boys and stays with them until they graduate high school. I mean, who does that? Who gives up all that many Sundays, that much time away for, from their family for camps and retreats and all the things that children and students ministry do to spend, you know, what is it, 11 years? You do weird stuff. You do great things for others when you, when you leave yourself open to let Jesus do work in your life. At the funeral of Ryan's dad, there he is, he's sharing the message with his family members about Jesus. He'd take any opportunity, big or small, to share the gospel, to share the message of Jesus with others. Later, he told me that his cousins hate Jesus. <laughs> but it didn't stop him. He was right there among them. Jesus, or Lou, or Ryan's living out this idea that changed people change things. Changed people change things. Things change when you're changed. Last week, we had Brian Head Welch here. And uh, this story is, again, just is another exclamation point on this. There's Ryan and Dan at the interview. But, you know, God got involved in his life at a really low point in Brian's life. And he was in drugs and addicted to these kinds of things. And um, he told this story on Saturday. And there's a picture from Saturday. Here's a picture from Sunday. He came back on Sunday and gave another, gave another talk here at Momentum Church. But one thing that stuck out to me from his story that Jesus transformed his life is that taking that first step toward Jesus can be scary, right? But if you're at your rock bottom, all you have, the only place you have to look is up, and Jesus is your only hope. He's your only hope. And so he shared this story with us, and now what is Brian doing? Is he playing air guitar every weekend with, Chris, with Justin? You know, like, no. <laughs> He's taking his message into the world and sharing it with other people. And you heard it here if you were here. You can watch it online. You can watch these two interviews at, at uh, our YouTube page. And I ask that you would because the story is so compelling. But simply put, Jesus changed him. Now he's wor his work is changing others and using his platform to do it. He went back to corn. He's sharing that with the guys he, worked, he works with in that band. You know, he's shared it with us and sharing it with people across the world. You do... Really interesting things when Jesus gets involved in your life. So here's what I want you to do. If you haven't done this already, and maybe this is your first time, maybe it's your 50th time to do this, is make a decision for Jesus. Maybe for the first time you decide, I'm going I'm I'm to follow Jesus. I need to do this. It's time. I need to do it. And here's the thing. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to know everything. But I think there's maybe just a few things you, you do need to know. Maybe four. Maybe Someone might say five or six. I think there's just maybe four. The first one is that you have a sin problem. You have to confess, I have a sin problem. I have a problem with sin. I want to do the wrong thing. I want to. I desire to. But you've got to confess that I have that problem and I can't fix it. And that's the second thing is that Jesus was sent to fix it. And Jesus was sent to forgive you of your sin. And the relationship 
to be restored back to God. That's why Jesus was sent. If you've come to accept this truth, like many of you probably have, and if you haven't, then making that decision, you're turning away from sin to follow Jesus, then to become baptized and to follow him with your life. And then this fourth one, which is connected and is, we are responsible for this, he's asking us to share that with others, to share that message with other people. We don't just get to stop with us. Okay, you fixed me, now I can chill. No, now I have the, I'm, I'm responsible for the lives around me. I'm responsible for the, for the kid who sits in front of me in class or the coworker over here or that person I don't want to talk to at the water cooler or that family member who... I want to leave my family for, you know, like I, those are the people that he wants us to go to. So in this story with this, and if you're, if you're a follower, then this, this story is like really helpful, I think, for to challenge you before we wrap up. But if you're not a follower, then just eavesdrop. It's, it's good information, but you're not on, under any obligation to do this. Um, Jossie Chaco, he's a, he's a missionary. Um, he works with Impart Ministries and, and his missions group their goal, their sole purpose is to affect Asia with the gospel, okay? Asia's a big continent, right? It's bigger than the United States. It's huge. And so Jossie tells a story about a missionary, this missionary that goes into this remote part of Asia, and the missionary's been sent there because they do not believe that Jesus, the message of Jesus, has made it into this area. So this missionary goes, he agrees to go into this area and to, and to stay put and share Jesus with this group of people, this community. But he arrives and he sees a guy with a little wooden cart as he walks into town selling warm Coca-Cola off the back of this cart. Right? There, there's, with refrigeration, there's nothing worse than a cold Coke. Just stick it in the freezer, you know? Like, but they're selling warm Coke off the back of this wagon. And this, it occurs to this missionary, how is it that in a hundred years... Coke did a better job of getting into this community than the message of Jesus did since it's been around 2,000 years. How did that happen? How are they better at it? Were they more in love with Coca-Cola? How does this happen? So we went on to challenge us in the room at this conference I was at with this statement. Telling others about Jesus is the main thing we've got to be focused on. In heaven, now there's nothing wrong with these things I'm about to mention. In heaven, though, there's study. We get to study. We get to be with the Lord there. There's study. We get to learn things we've never learned before. And that's cool. We also get to sing. There's lots of songs in heaven. In Revelation, apparently, there's just one song. It's like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to, is to come. Uh, repeat. You know, but you just... But there's singing in heaven. There's study and there's singing in heaven. But there's not sharing Jesus with people in heaven. We don't get to do that there. We get to do that here. So because we don't get to do that in heaven, let's focus on that here so we can get more people there. So my challenge is for you today is to, is to think about who do I have to tell? Who does God want me to talk to? It might be a challenging person. It might be someone at lunch that you just, I'm going to go sit down and God led me to this person to talk to. And, and please don't be weird about it. Don't just, hey, what are you eating? Nah, this is pasta salad. Do you know who Jesus is? Like, maybe you just... <laughs> Let the conversation kind of get there, you know. But who do you got to talk to? Be th that person, is it coming in mind right now? Maybe you see their face. Maybe with their face, you already feel some anxiety. Maybe frustration, like, don't put them in my mind, God. <laughs> Maybe that's who you got to go talk to and share this message with. You know, Jesus did all of this. Died on the cross for our sins and so that we could share this message with others. We get to celebrate that every week right now in, in communion. You know, we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus transformed us through his dying on the cross and the, his body and blood that was shed for us. This is a reminder, a sacred moment where we get to remember what he did for us. So in a couple seconds, trays are going to be passed. And if you're a follower, then this is time for you to reflect on what Jesus has done for you. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, then please just let the trays pass. But be thinking about the question, what, maybe I need to make that decision for myself. And what does it mean to follow Jesus? And have that conversation with someone you've seen on stage or you're, you know, someone you're close to here that you know, goes here. But begin, let's take a step towards people. Let's take a step towards Jesus because he is the only hope that we have.
Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the time we've got to look at Scripture, for the challenge it gives us, but God, more importantly, for the action that we need to take. I pray that we take it. I pray that we just don't think this is a good message I, This is, and high-five each other because we heard something cool, but, but we would actually walk away and do it. And that you would lead us to people and lead us to situations where people could be affected by what's affecting us. Thank you so much, God, for your son Jesus who laid his life down for us on the cross so that we could have a repaired relationship with you. And I pray these things in his name.